can turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 8 with me this evening. In Joshua chapter 7, we studied the first battle for Ai and we saw a, a chapter which records for us bitter defeat um, at the hands of a fairly easy enemy, I suppose. Um, we also saw the sin of Achan as the cause of that defeat and the dealing with that sin bringing about hope. Uh, it is lovely to know that uh, this this place is known as the door of hope in the book of Hosea and it reminds us that God is in the business of, of restoring uh, those who fall into or choose willfully to enter into sin. Um, there is no moral error, no moral failure or mistake that cannot be remedied by God's grace. I, am, I love it that the gospel is open to all. No sin prevents folks from being saved. You can tell a murderer on death row that he can be forgiven his sin and enjoy eternal life and that's not maybe I hope that God will forgive him, his sin was really bad. No, God is in, his grace is so great that the, the most vile of sin that we can comprehend is redeemable and that is remarkable. We see here that though the enemy uh, thwarted the attempts of the, uh, the children of Israel to overcome Ai, it was due to sin in the camp which has now been dealt with and at the end of chapter 26 we see a memorial being raised the end of sorry chapter 7 verse 26 and they raised over him that's over the uh, the body the, the remains of Achan they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day why would they do that so nobody would forget so that people might go past and go what are those stones there for well, let me tell you what those stones are there for. Don't forget, don't make the mistake of Achan. So they raised a great heap of stones unto this day, so the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day, the Valley of Achor, the, the Valley of Trouble. And we, uh, we take encouragement that God is in the business of restoration. Um, Psalm 37 verse 23 tells us that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Are you grateful that the Lord upholds you um, as a believer? And though we fall, we are not utterly cast down. I am grateful that the Lord takes delight in the path that we are on. Um, he takes delight in the affairs of life and, and right when we fall and feel like we've failed and abandoned or, or even we might even presume ourselves to be abandoned because we can't comprehend a God of so much love. Uh, God is right there to restore us. Um, the victorious Christian life, it has been said, is a series of new beginnings. That's a good way of putting it. A series of new beginnings because none of us walk in perfection and we all know what it is to stumble and fall and fail and to enjoy the restoring grace of our God once more. Uh, the victorious Christian life, a series of new beginnings, and we see one such new beginning for the nation of Israel in chapter 8. Uh, defeat turned into victory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we open the Scriptures and as we seek you and seek to understand your word, that your Spirit might minister to the needs of each soul and help us to be encouraged in the way that you worked throughout history which reminds us of your character, which is true and consistent and without change today. Uh, you restored a nation that sinned, you brought them back into usefulness and you gave them a victory here over the enemy and we are grateful that you are in the business of doing the same for each one that calls upon the Lord. There's a lot of spiritual lessons that we can take, but Lord, help us also to see the, the journey of the nation of Israel as they seek to uh, claim the promised land that you had promised to their forefathers and to be the inheritors of the promises. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to see this new beginning, a brand new battle plan, the likes of which this nation had not seen before and they're going to experience victory in ways that they had not seen before. We'll see at the last part of our chapter a new commitment to the Lord and the law of the Lord. And if the Lord allows us, we will cover really all of chapter 8 tonight, but we certainly won't be able to read the repetitive, there's some repetitive verses in the middle of the chapter that we're going to skip over for the sake of time. 
but we'll see here a victory, uh, a new battle plan, a, a victory secured as the uh, children of Israel walk in obedience, and then their expression of worship and their recommitment at the end of the chapter, which is really important for us to make sure we bring into context. But firstly, let's look at verses 1 and 2, and we'll see the call to fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Have a look, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Joshua, fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Now that's, we can even pause and think about how do you think Joshua was feeling after losing men in a battle which, uh, in a losing battle? How do you think he's feeling as a leader? I mean, I can only tell you as a leader of a church how I would feel and do feel when I see souls go by the wayside. It's, it's bitterly discouraging when you see things not go according to to plan or you see things going in a way and you go, this is not right. But here, God speaks into Joshua's situation and says, fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Um, When I fall into sinful failure in my life, I know personally that I have often responded in two main ways. One is to, to be discouraged about the past and apprehensive about the future. You find yourself in that place? Why would God even save me? Why would he use me? I'm just like, this is ridiculous. And then I think, and what's going to, it's going to happen again tomorrow. You know, I failed in the past. I'm just going to fail again in the future. Um, I can wonder sometimes if there's any hope for a person like me. And I know that might sound silly when I say it up here, but that's how you feel when you're struggling with sin. You think, is there really any future? Is the Lord going to use me? Is he done with me? Am I going to sit on a shelf and not be used. And Joshua, after failing, the nation of Israel, after defeat, hear these words, fear not, neither be thou dismayed. It would be well worth each one of us studying the phrase, fear not, in the Scriptures. Because when God speaks into the situations where men hear those words from the lips of or from the voice of God, we see that men are always encouraged they take great delight in this instruction. Virtually all of them, different situations, different problems, but the fear not from the Lord is always encouraging. The Word of God meets their need. God is not a God of discouragement. You know who discourages the hearts of believers? I was going to say the devil, but truthfully, other believers. (laughs) Isn't it sad that other believers can be the source of discouragement for believers? Even our own minds, our own flesh can be the source of discouragement for believers, but the devil himself, the accuser of the brethren, can be a source of discouragement. God does not. And God is there seeking to restore that which has been damaged through sin. God cares to encourage us. He cares that we grow. He doesn't want to set aside on the scrap heap or feeling as we are. He brings words of encouragement. Then he gives a plan. Verse 1 is a summary and we see it unfold here of the instruction from God to Joshua and then to the people. He says, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee and arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given into thy hand the king of Ai and his people and his city and his land. That's pretty encouraging, isn't it? To those who've had to turn tail and run and suffer embarrassing defeat to be told that God now in response to the sanctifying of the nation and the the driving out and the dealing with the sin of Achan we see here God say I've given the king his people his city and his land into your hand God has a plan for his people to follow and they they needed to like we need to walk in obedience to his instruction Who did Joshua listen to in chapter 7? Don't send the whole army up. It's too much of a climb. It's too much of an inconvenience. No, just send a small group. We're well able. Who did Joshua listen to? He listened to the spies. He listened to the the men who came back with a report saying, AI, piece of cake. And he didn't, didn't listen to the Lord. Now here he listens to the Lord and God tells him rather than sending a small fighting force to overcome a small enemy, he says, send everybody. This time we see the promise and I I just want to see maybe it's a latter verse that we might see. No, it's... It's a latter verse. I don't have the reference here. We'll probably stumble across it as I work my way through the text but I want us to see 
that the command to the soldiers this time is to destroy the city and to burn it with fire, but the spoils are for the soldiers. Isn't it kind of bitterly ironic that what Achan took illicitly from Jericho, he could have had permissively from Ai? I don't know that they had Babylonian garments and gold wedges there. It was maybe not quite as illustrious as Jericho. But the spoils of war that he so desperately longed for in Jericho were rightfully his at Ai if he could but wait. And the sad truth is he could not. Um, God promises the victory. Every promise that God makes must be claimed by faith. It must be believed. It must be received. I think um, Hebrews 4 verse 2 kind of brings that in, in relation to the gospel, the admixture, the, the mixing of faith and promise. Um, Hebrews 4 2 says, For unto us it was, was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. I mean, God can make promises, but unless we believe Him, then we don't enjoy the fruit of those promises the way that God intends us to. And the children of Israel here could either choose to go, okay, God's given us the land of Ai, the king, the people, the city and his land, and we're going to follow in his instruction here or we're not. They could choose to believe his word and walk in faith. And thankfully, Joshua leads the nation to walk in faith. And it's interesting we see here a whole new strategy. And this is important and even instructional to us. Um, verse 3 through 13, we see the new battle plan that Joshua is given by God. And I'll read these verses to you, but we're probably going to skip over from verse 14 right down to like 29, where we, res we read about the actual battle unfolding. But I'd like for us just to spend the moment looking at the whole new strategy that God gives to Joshua. Verse 3. Um, well, verse 2 is also important. And thou shalt do to Ai and her king as thou didst to Jericho and her king. Only the spoil thereof and the cattle thereof shall you take for a prey unto yourselves. Lay thee in ambush for the city behind it. That's what I was looking for. The spoils of Ai were for the soldiers. Um, do the same thing. Destroy everything, but take the cattle. Take the spoils for yourself. Verse 3, the different strategy. So Joshua rose and all the people of war to go up against Ai. And Joshua chose out 30,000 men, mighty men of valor, and sent them away by night. And he commanded them, saying, Behold, you shall lie in wait against the city, even behind the city. Go not very far from the city, but ye be, be, be ye all ready. He tells 30,000 of the soldiers to hide around and flank the city and be prepared, be watching, be ready. And then he says in verse 5, And I and all the people that are with me will approach unto the city, and it shall come to pass when they come out against us, as at the first, that they that we will flee before them. For they will come out after us, till we have drawn them from the city, for they will say they flee before us as at the first, therefore we will flee before them. Then you shall rise up from the ambush and seize upon the city, for the Lord your God will deliver it into your hand, and it shall be, when you have taken the city, that you shall set the city on fire according to the commandment of the Lord shall you do. See, I have commanded you. Um, verse 9, continuing on here, we'll just read the plan. Joshua therefore sent them forth, and they went to lie in ambush and abode between Bethel and Ai on the west side of Ai. But Joshua lodged that night among the people. Joshua rose up early in the morning and numbered the people and went up, he and the elders of Israel, before the people to Ai. And all the people, even the people of war that were with him, went up and drew nigh, came before the city and pitched on the north side of Ai, now there was a valley between them and Ai. And he took about 5,000 of them and set them to lie in ambush between Bethel and Ai on the west city, west side of the city. Now, just pausing there. You've got 30,000 behind Ai. You've got everyone else approaching from the front, but he leaves 5,000 there um, between Bethel and Ai. Now, why would he do that? Because the moment the, the horns or the trumpets of war are sounded in Ai, who's going to come running? Bethel. So he's preventing the reinforcements from coming to catch his fighting force. And in fact, there is a latter portion of Joshua, and I don't know the reference right now, that records for us the kings of Canaan that were destroyed by Joshua and his forces, and the king of Bethel is mentioned there, though it, there's no mention of the battle throughout Joshua. So my understanding is that the horns of war were sounded, 
Bethel came out after Ai and the 5,000 men routed them as well. That's my understanding because the kings destroyed somewhere in the conquest. We don't know where and here we see a fighting force there lying wait to ambush the reinforcements that would inevitably come. So it's, it's putting, it's kind of like there's dots and we're kind of joining the dots a little bit on that um, but that's my, my understanding of how and why and when that happened. Where were we? It's very repetitive, isn't it? You wonder why I'm not going to read through the actual account of what happened because it pretty much says the same thing. He's, he's giving instruction to his people saying, this is what we're going to do. And then from verse 14, he goes on and says, and this is what happened. <laughs> it's, it's almost word for word, exactly how God said to, to do it, that this is what will be. Um, so verse 13, just to round out the description. When they had set the people, even all the host that was on the north of the city and their lies in wait on the west of the city, Joshua went that night into the midst of the valley. And that little thought there will flesh out a little bit later. What, did, what was Joshua doing the night before Jericho? Do you remember when he met the Lord outside just adjoining the city, adjacent to the city, and the Lord encouraged him and challenged him and said, you know, he said, saw the, the, the figure with the sword drawn, he said, are you for us or against us? And he said, well, no, hang on, I'm the Lord. I'm the Lord of the hosts and, and you're on my side, not the other way around. Here we see Joshua off by himself in the night just before the battle. And I, I think that he was probably seeking the face of his God um, in that moment. A very simple plan, uh, effective, common sense, military you know, strategy is on display here um, and it transpired just as God said it would. So what do we learn from this? I learn that God uses different means at different times. Do you ever feel like you get stuck in a rut in ministry? feel like we just keep doing the same thing every day, you know, week in, week out, it's the same thing. Uh, I think God uses different strategy in different ways and different means because it helps us to continue to depend on Him. If every city was like Jericho, if every conquest was exactly the same, what inevitably would happen to the hearts of the children of Israel? Would they continue to depend on the Lord as they need or would they just go through the motions? And here we see a change of strategy, a change of technique. It builds on the defeat. It's a teaching lesson saying, I'm able to even transform, you know how you fled and tucked tail and ran? Yeah, I'm going to use that to give you the victory because when you tuck tail and run again, they're going to come out and I'm going to give them into your hand. So God uses different means and I, I'm grateful for that because I think one of our greatest dangers is that we get trapped in, into the rut of routine. And we just presume that everything is just going to keep on moving the way it has. And, and I think God intends for things to be for his, his power and his wisdom and his means and his methods to vary so that we're left going, wow, God is able and I need to depend on him no matter what. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that he uses sinful means or worldly means. I'm not trying to change the way we do things as a church. We just have to recognize that God's ways are not always the way we expect or the way that he worked in the past. Because here we see a very different strategy on display. If we knew that God always gave the victory, like Jericho, what would the children of Israel be doing at the next city without even consulting the Lord? They'd be marching around the city. I've got this under control. It works the way it did last time. We just do it again. And who are they trusting for the victory? They're trusting the fact that they're repeating what God told them to do yesterday for today and we need to be careful about that. This is what I see here from the change of strategy, that God wants us trusting Him today for the challenges of the day, not repeating the, the path to victory from yesterday. Um, what's the end result? And I'm not going to read from verse 14 and following. Um, yeah, it, it's just, it's too much for our time tonight. Jump down to verse 28, 29. You'll see Joshua burnt Ai and made it in heap forever, even a desolation under this day. You know, archaeologists can't find the, the remnants for Ai. It's, it's been lost to history, uh, destroyed and not recovered. And verse 29, and the king of Ai, he hanged on a tree until eventide. As soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they should take his carcass down from the tree and cast it at the entering of the gate of the city and raise thereon a great heap of stones that remaineth unto this day. You remember that happening to somebody else just last chapter? Achan was 
stoned and burnt and buried with stones and his household. And he was left there as a memorial or the stones were left as a memorial. Here we see another, we see another mound of stones in the entrance to Ai as a memorial for the victory. So what should they do? What do you expect you would do if you were running a military campaign, marching into enemy territory and you've just got one victory and you've been driving a wedge right through kind of the east-west line between the, the north and south of the promised land? What do, you, what do you do? Do you strike while the iron's hot? Do you press on? I would. Most military campaigns would. You don't want to sit there any longer than you have to, but that's not what the children of Israel do. They stop. They stop for worship. And you see it in verse 30. Then Joshua built an altar under the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal. Immediately after the battle, Joshua and his army go back to Gilgal, collect what seems to be, to me, to be about 2 million men, women and children, as well as all their animals, and go back 15 miles up the summit to the, the spine of the Judean hills. They travel 30 miles north of the valley of Shechem between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim or Jerizim, the valley of Shechem there, which we hear of often in Scripture. Now, they were moving around doing all these things, following the instructions of God, and we will see what transpires here is a, rem a remarkable demonstration and recommitment of their faith. Joshua built an altar under the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal. It's fulfilling the plans, and the, command the plans of God and the commands of Moses. This is what God, through Moses, instructed them to do, and we'll look at that just in a moment. But it's worth reminding, and it, I think I need the reminder, worship is vitally important. Evangelism is important, but worship is vitally important. You can't, we can't burn our light as a church evangelizing the lost without stopping to worship the one who made us and saved us. The worship services that are held by the church are part of that and I'm grateful for the folks that come out to worship. It is very important that in the battle we take the time to worship our God. Though perhaps the opportune moment is to push on in the conquest and attack more cities with momentum at their side, they stop, spend a number of days in the valley before the Lord as a community spending time in worship. Moses asks Joshua to do three things when he was prior to Joshua entering the land because Moses didn't make it. Moses asked Joshua to do three things. Build an altar where sacrifices could be made and sin could be dealt with. Write the law on stones and read the law aloud to people. And Joshua does all three of these things here. Have a look in verse 30. We see the altar. Verse 31 as Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones over which no man hath lift up any iron, and they offered thereon burnt offerings unto the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. An altar of unhewn stones, a place of sacrifice, a place of burnt offerings. This place between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal is known as the Valley of Shechem and it is mentioned many times in Scripture. A very important part of the world. More than 600 years earlier when Abraham first came to the land of Haran, he stopped there and built his first altar of sacrifice and thanksgiving to the Lord here. Later when Jacob was running back home away from his uncle Laban, he ran to Shechem for safety with his family. When Joseph was looking for his brothers just before they sold him, into slavery, he went to Shechem after Joseph's death in Egypt and his body was, his body was brought back into the land of promise. It may, have, may well have been buried in Shechem. Jacob dug a well in Shechem very near this place, a well which Jesus himself later offered a Samaritan woman life-giving water. You realise this is a valuable place, important place. Joshua builds his altar on Mount Ebal, on that mountain, Moses directed the people to recite certain curses. Turn in your Bibles, please, um, to see if I've got the right references here. Maybe let's have a look. Deuteronomy 27, verse 11.
Deuteronomy 27, 11. And Moses charged the people the same day, saying, These shall stand upon Mount Gerizim to bless the people when you come over the Jordan, Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Joseph and Benjamin. And all these shall stand upon the Mount Ebal to curse Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan and Naphtali. And the Levites shall speak and say unto all the men of Israel with a loud voice, Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image, and so on. See here, Moses gives instruction and he tells which tribes to go on which side. And there's two mountains in adjacent the valley of Shechem. The Levites would, I believe, be in the bottom there speaking the law. And each tribe would be on, upon the side they've been assigned, some on Ebal and some on Gerizim. And there would be the reciting of the blessings and the cursings. And Mount Ebal was the place of the reciting of the cursings. Mount Gerizim, the place of blessings. And here we would, that makes sense to me because where did, where did Joshua s- establish the, the altar of sacrifice for burnt offering? On Mount Ebal, which was on the Mount of Cursing. I'll see if I've, I don't want to skip over anything here because it's, it kind of, it, it brings things together in a very neat way. What we see instructed in Deuteronomy, we see fulfilled by the nation here. Moses directed the people to recite the curses. We also see the reciting of the blessings. And you can see that in Deuteronomy 11 previously, verse 26 through 30, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. But turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. It shall come to pass when the Lord thy God hath brought thee in unto the land whither thou goest to possess it, that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Ebal. Are they not on the other side of Jordan by the way where the sun goeth down in the land of the Canaanites which dwell um, in the Champagne over against Gilgal beside the plains of Moreh? So um, what I'm trying to show you is that this was instructed in the law um, here in the book of Deuteronomy. Moses gave instructions about what would transpire when the children of Israel entered the land and it would involve the tribes fanning out in the valley, an altar of sacrifice made there upon the Mount of Cursing and there would be the reciting of the law. And what we see here in the end of chapter 8 is exactly that. Verse 32, And he wrote there upon the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel. By the way, it was a common practice when a, a king might conquer a particular place or he, um, see the billboards you, you see on the highways you drive past advertising who knows what. I don't know what the latest ones are. They tend to change because they're all digital now. You know, the, going down the motorway, you've got billboards advertising something. That's not a new concept. Uh, that's been done for centuries. In fact, a king, when he would go through and conquer a land, he might establish large stones as a billboard in a place and he would whitewash them and then he would, he would write his exploits over the billboard so that people would come past and go, oh yeah, this is where the, you know, this is rejoicing because the Israelites defeated the, the king of Ai and the king of Bethel. Like that's what they would anticipate and the pagan cultures would do this. So when this altar of unhewn stones is set up and when this, what it seems to be, the, the billboard is established, the anticipation would be that there would be writing of the conquests of men, but rather than that, we see Joshua instructing the writing of the law of Moses on the altar of whole stones. Wrote there upon the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel. And all Israel and their elders and officers and their judges stood on on this side, um, the ark and on that side before the priests of the Levites which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord as well as the stranger as he that was born among them, half of them over against Mount Gerizim, half of them over against Mount Ebal as Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded before that they should bless the people of Israel. And afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessings and cursings according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded which Joshua read not before all the congregation of Israel with the women and the little ones and the strangers that were conversant among them. All right, so we made it to the end of the chapter. We've done, we got there. And maybe some of that all went over your head, but when you're reading through Joshua 8, um, it'll all kind of make sense. We see the fulfillment here of 
the, the reading of the blessings and cursings, the altar established and the altar being established on the Mount of Cursings is wonderfully instructive to us because what is it that, that averts or covers, all right? It's the blood of the sacrifice, all right? The cursing is, mm, there's so much instructive there about Jesus being made a curse for us as well. But let's leave that for now. Um, let's see. This place, the Valley of Shechem, is in, at the moment, what is like the West Bank. It's not a place that we can go and visit. If you tried to get there, you probably wouldn't be allowed. Um, but it is a, a natural amphitheatre. Some people go, how can, how can the Levites, how can they read all the words of Moses to all of these people, men, women, children, strangers and foreigners and people that are... How, two million people, if that's what it was, there in tribes up either side of the mountains, um, how does that work? But if we were able to go to that place, I read that it's a natural amphitheatre and just speaking with a, with a loud carrying voice in the bottom of the valley carries across the mountains um, in, a, in a unique way. Um, so how that works, and, and if that's not a natural um, amplifier of voice, then I'm sure God is able to bring a supernatural amplifier of voice. I, I mean, God is, is not limited to natural means but you can find this place, you, one day we may, might be able to go there, um, a mountain of blessing and a mountain of cursing, which raises the question for you and me, because today we, we don't live under the law and we don't, we don't live under the cursing and the blessing the same way the children of Israel did. I mean, the curse has been dealt for us because Christ became a curse and he bore in his body the curse. Uh, we are in like a valley between the two and really our our valley of of curse is probably Calvary, right? Because there he was made a curse for us. And the valley of blessing might, if you could say it this way, be the Mount of Olives when the Lord returns in glory. Um, we don't live under the same economy as the children of Israel, the same law. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, been made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. As Christians, we're told in Ephesians that we are blessed uh, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And we can take great encouragement for that. I'm glad that as we read through Joshua 8, we see that God is a God who restores those who, who go astray. He blesses with victory those that we would say don't deserve it. But praise God for that. He uses different means, uh, different methods, and I think that's to make sure we continue to, to depend on Him throughout the journey. Um, we don't presume upon uh, the routine that He has established. We, we're constantly seeking His face. And I'm, I'm grateful of the example of Joshua. I didn't bring it out as we worked our way through, but we see Him as a leader the first night with the people. Um, then we see Him the second night out there in the, in the wilderness, out by himself, seeking the face of God. And I, I'm grateful for that example as a leader. We see the fulfilment of the, the instructions of Moses to Joshua and the children of Israel. I'm glad that they started by trusting God for the battle plan and then they continued by trusting God and obeying the words of Moses in fulfilling this, building the altar, sacrificing, uh, when they could have tried to strike while the iron's hot and drive the victory further. They stopped. They gathered the women and children from down where they were at Gilgal and brought them up and, and uh, spent the time reading, reciting, and I think affirming the law in this. And in all of it, we see wonderful instruction um, that we, we can learn from their faith and their trust in God's word and their determination to walk in obedience to it and the victory that they enjoyed. Uh, the Christian life, the victorious Christian life is one of a series of new beginnings and I'm grateful for the new beginning that we read of in chapter 8. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, your grace, mercy, your forgiveness. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God who, who is compassionate and tender towards us and that you raise up those that are cast down. We thank you that you heal the broken, that you... You bring about strength for those with feeble knees. You help us to walk aright and true. 
I pray that our faith and our dependence in you would grow from day to day through the trials of life and the battles that, that you allow. I pray, Father, that you might help us to see your plan in it all. And the children of Israel were reminded of the path of curse and blessing and all of this is pointing to you that one day you will deal with the curse upon mankind and that you would bless in abundance through your Saviour, through our Saviour. Lord, wonderfully instruction, wonderful instruction to the children of Israel and yet we see uh, we are the wonderful recipients of so much of that. Lord, I pray that you might help us as a church to grow and to be used mightily of you. Help us not to miss the need to worship, to stop in, in the journey of life and to spend dedicated time seeking you through your word and um, reaffirming what we believe. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.